Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle. Joined by my permanent co-host, Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel, and also joined with us by a special guest. We got Brian Kaplan, who teaches economics at George Mason University. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Yeah, you know, Brian, I wanted to have you on because, you know, as you know, one of the big controversial issues in the libertarian movement is open immigration and to a larger extent open borders and you gave one of the greatest talks i've ever heard in um, on the issue of open immigration or open borders and uh, it's, it's a position that richard and i have long held and so we both thought hey let's have brian on the show to discuss open immigration specifically and well to a larger extent open borders so why don't we start out with you giving us the, the, the case for open immigration in uh, sort of a shorthand way. Why do you feel in today's times uh, that, that the borders ought to be open to the free movements of people and to a, certain, to a large extent goods and services? Yeah, well, for libertarians, I'd say it's a pretty easy case. Uh, in the same way that it is not, or you know, it should not be a crime to go and import a good across the borders. Why should it be a crime to move labor across the borders? Why should it be government that decides whether or not I am allowed to employ a foreigner in my home or in my business? Why is the government decides whether a foreigner is free to come here and rent an apartment, take a job? Uh, so really in terms of just the presumption, it seems like when someone comes here to get a job or to live, they are doing nothing that would normally be considered a crime if they if they happen to be brought, uh, born on the right side of the border. So what does it matter if they were born on the wrong side? Or another way you might think about it is that immigration re regu immigration restrictions are the ultimate form of punishing people for choosing the wrong parents. Uh, normally seen as a clear-cut clear case of injustice to punish people for choosing the wrong parents. Uh, now for you know, non-libertarians or people with some libertarian sympathies, uh, the main thing I would think about is, well, you know, at least it seems like preventing someone from, uh, from taking a job from a willing employer, from renting a place from a willing landlord, is the kind of thing that would need to be justified. There need to be some good reason to stop them. And this is where I would go to the social science on immigration. Uh, the part of the social science is that immigration is a great way of enriching the world because it moves labor from places where it is not very valuable to places where it is very valuable and thereby makes the world a richer place just in the same way that having people move from Antarctica to Kansas for farming is a way of enriching the world because you're moving people out of places where they can't accomplish much to places where they can accomplish a lot. Uh, of course there's a lot more to it but in terms of understanding the benefits of immigration for the world it really does come down to it is it is a great shame to go and trap trap valuable labor in places where it cannot accomplish anything near of what it could in, um, in more auspicious uh, certain more more auspicious uh, circumstances yeah you know we often think of, of immigration controls libertarians do that as infringements on the right of people to uh, go elsewhere seek a better life sustain their life through labor through economic activity um, which, of course, it is an infringement on, on economic liberty, but it's also an infringement on the right of the American people, of course. as you point out. Yes, uh, yes so immigration restrictions uh, stop Americans who want to hire foreigners from hiring foreigners, stop Americans who want to go and, re and rent, a, 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 a rent uh, their real estate or sell their real estate to foreigners from doing so. So, yeah, of course, uh, you know, really what they do is they prevent trade between Americans and foreigners, which is bad for the Americans and the foreigners at minimum. And then you need to turn to social science to figure out, all right, besides the people who are direct, the direct parties to this transaction, is there anything else going on that we should worry about? And you know, at least the main thing to think about is, yeah, the main, is that there's, there's not just the parties of benefit, but there's also a great enrichment of the world because you're moving productive labor from places where it can't accomplish very much, like Haiti, to places where it can accomplish a great deal, like Miami. Yeah, Richard? Yeah. Um... I, I, often in discussions, Brian, and so uh, I'm, in this I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit to try to clarify the issues, if I may. Sure. Uh, when, when you're talking to people who do not necessarily share classical liberal and libertarian views on this way, let's be honest, the three of us do, mm -hmm. uh, the, the kind of issues that come up are at least 
a couple of them are the following, let me suggest. And I, I think it would be useful for the viewers and listeners to have you know, your, your explanations of the response. Uh, the first one, perhaps, is, uh, is that such free immigration uh, would certainly be uh, beneficial in the sense that you mean of specialization, intensified division of labor, a greater productivity, um, and so on, from the narrow economic point of view. But in the real world, we also have this other institutional setting in which this would all be occurring, and that is the welfare state. That it, in, the, in terms of practical politics, uh, it often seems as if uh, on, uh, on the uh, liberal democratic side of the discourse of this, uh, it seems as if they seem interested in having this uh, flow of immigration so as to have uh, people who will have eligibility for welfare benefits, uh, the whole arrangement of entitlement programs over time. Uh, and then as they become citizens, they will already ha be in the dependency network and then will be voters to maintain and sustain it. And I often feel that this is part, at least, of, of the concerns and hesitancies and fears of our conservative friends. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you perhaps would deal with that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the, you know, qualitatively, the concern is, of course, true. <laughs> Uh, the main thing to think about here is you know, how big of an issue is this really in the broad scheme of things, as well as, of course, what is the best way to deal with it, uh, you know, depending upon how big it is. So there's been a lot of work where, where, uh, where economists and other people have just tried to measure what is going to be the net fiscal effect of immigration. So if you go and look at all of the benefits that new immigrants typically receive, compare those to all the taxes they typically pay, where does it come out? Uh, there are a lot of papers on this, but most of them come out in the neighborhood of about zero, zero fiscal effect. And again, if that seems very hard to believe, the key thing to remember is that immigrants usually have their public schooling paid for by their home country. And, you know, and, and in term, and, and investment terms, these very high upfront costs for educating people and their kids are a huge part of the reason why a human being might be a fiscal drain on American society. So really what happens when you get an adult immigrant is they show up their government has already paid you know, many thousands of dollars in order to educate them. They are not likely to get too much more education once they're here at taxpayer expense. They start working, they start paying taxes, uh, and the benefits they receive compared to the costs that, uh, that would have been paid to educate them are quite small. So when you go and just crunch the numbers, it comes out to be you know, on balance, a, if not a great deal for taxpayers, at least not much of a burden at all. So that, and again, like it's so hard for people to believe this, but again, like you have to remember how much of the cost of, go of government goes for public education, and in, fi and in terms of financial cost, how important it is that it comes early, because when you are calculating the, uh, you know, the, 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 the total value, you know, the, the, the total investment value of a human being, to, or a total burden on taxpayers, costs that come early matter a lot more than costs that come later. Uh, in the same way that it is for any business. I don't know if we want to go over present discounted value here. Probably not. Uh, and then on top of that, it's important to remember that so much of what government does actually has nothing to do with population. So like, you know, whatever your views on foreign policy, if there's a baby boom, no one says we need more nuclear weapons to defend the extra babies. There's a lot of government services are what economists call non-rival, which means that you can let in a, you know, there can be a large increase in population and the cost of doing a lot of government things doesn't actually go up which also means that it's not so hard to believe that the fiscal effects uh, come, out, come out favorably. Now in terms of you know, what could you do to make it more favorable, uh, important to remember that the eligibility for government programs is not a law of nature. It's not like Planck's constant or something like that. There can be rules about who is eligible to collect and when. There are actually already are plenty of these rules on the books. For example, you need to work uh, 10 years full time to collect Social Security. So, you know, if you were concerned about this, the obvious thing to do would be to focus on limiting the benefits that immigrants can receive, say you have to pay a certain amount of taxes, say you have to pay 100,000 taxes before working like benefits, or something along those lines, rather than trying to stop people. And again, what I, what I see in these debates is that while there is a lot of concern raised about the welfare state, they do generally strike me as insincere in that when you listen to the literal complaints, and say, okay, here are your complaints. Here is something that we can do that will address your complaints without preventing hardworking people from coming here and getting jobs. Rarely do people then say, okay, that would be that's a totally fair uh, you know, suggestion, or at least that's going to make me think. Instead, normally, people change the arguments because really it is the people they object to, and the arguments are there to rationalize the complaints rather than uh, rather than forming the real basis for the complaints. Yeah, I think this so is. If, if yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, sure, Richard. So, if 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 
if you feel that people change the terms of the debate uh, when uh, uh, a reasonable economic argument is presented along the lines you've suggested, uh, what do you th think then becomes the basis of the resistance to the arrival of, of, of new residents? I mean, ultimately, my honest answer is I think it is just xenophobia. People, you know, they are breathing our air. Uh, there's, a, you know, there's many other complaints, and I, there are certainly some reasonable people who sincerely believe those complaints, but out of the immigration arguments that I've had with most people, I do notice that there is the machine gun tactic of make a complaint, if it's responded to, then rather than defend it or change your mind, just move to a different complaint, and then after five such rounds, often moving back to the first complaint again, without any recognition that the things that, that has been addressed, so you can just, and, and like, and also another sign about you know, what's really motivating is that people make a lot of complaints about immigrants that apply very well to many people who are natives, and yet they are not made. So again, if you're concerned about human beings who will, who are statistically likely to use welfare and are statistically likely to vote for Democrats, there are plenty of native groups that fit that description. So you know, so Black Americans fit that description very well. Yet almost no one would suggest doing the slightest thing in order to reduce the fertility. And I'm not suggesting that people do that, but rather, if they were consistent, they would. So, you know, like, uh, wait, if someone says, look, I'm not going to let in anyone with a beard into my party, and you say, wait, there's a bunch of people with beards in the party right now. Say, well, um, yeah, they don't count. Or, you know, like, that's rude to mention that. It's like, well, you're the one who said you're not letting in anyone with a beard, and yet you've let in a bunch of people with beards. So what's the difference between the people you let in and the ones that you're not letting in? It isn't really the beards that are, bo that, that are bothering you. What's bothering you is something about the people and you're using the beards as an excuse for something that you want to do for some other reason. I, I think this point is, is really um, applicable to, to libertarians because libertarians understand that, this, that immigration controls really are an infringement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think Milton Friedman was partly responsible for this where he said, you know, you could never have open immigration with a welfare state. Well, I, I say nonsense because there's a certain percentage of people that are not going on welfare. And what the libertarian is saying is, let's infringe on those people's rights because a small percentage of the group is going to go on welfare. Mm -hmm. I don't see how that infringement can be reconciled with libertarian principles. Uh, I think it, uh, the argument ought to be the way you make it is let's focus on, on the welfare state itself. Uh, for example, I don't think any libertarian would say, let's wait to legalize drugs until we get rid of Medicare. Uh, and we take the principal position. You get rid of the, the, the drug war, regardless of whether Medicare is abolished or not. Right, right. And I, I would also say, well, you know, there's the reasonable moderate libertarian just saying, well, I would, I, I would favor, I would oppose legalizing drugs uh, you know, until Medicare is abolished if that would lead to a very large increase in medical costs. And then, all right, let's go and take a look and crunch the numbers and see how, come, how that comes out. Uh, but uh, again, like so, you know, so I have looked at the numbers, or you know, re really, re I've read the research from people who have looked at the numbers, and it just doesn't seem like it's anywhere in that ballpark. So even from someone who just says I have a libertarian tendency, and I'm not really any kind of absolutist, I'm not treating this as some uh, as some deep philosophy. It's just where I start from. You know, for that person, I would say, well, that's enough, really, to actually get you to the pro-immigration view. And again, not just pro-immigration relative to normal American discourse. But you know, real pro-immigration of saying, look, immigrants, uh, foreign foreigners have a right to come here. They have a right to work here. They have a right to rent, a right to rent here. You know, if there's someone here that wants to employ them or rent to them, then there's no more, there's no more the business of the American voter to say they can't, than to say that someone is born here isn't, isn't able to take a job or isn't able to live in a certain place here. Richard, well, yeah, l l uh, if I can be, continue to put on my devil's advocate hat here, feel free. Um, uh, another argument that uh, our conservative and sometimes even on the left uh, friends will make uh, has to do with the cultural aspect mm -hmm. of it. I'm not talking about the issue. Well, what if a terrorist sneaks in? You know, right, right, sure, sure. Put that aside. Put that aside. Uh, but people will look at what seems to be the, the the magnification of their concerns in the recent events in Germany with this mm -hmm. influx of of Arabs, Muslims. Um, who are escaping or, and wishing to move for one reason or another. Uh, the, the idea is that, 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 the, that, that the cultural difference is, is so great that, that, the, that the difficulty of assimilating uh, uh, a religion and the culture that accompanies that religion to be compatible, sufficiently compatible with the, the general more secular 
and individualist philosophical basis of our society, uh, it's difficult to see how it can be remedied. Um, now, obviously, there's not a concern that, you know, a bunch of refugees arrive from the Middle East and suddenly America is, you know, majority Muslim, let's say. Uh, but there is the concern that in our environment with multiculturalism as, a, as an ideological icon among many on the left and a, and, and a seemingly, uh, limited resistance to it by conservatives uh, in the political arena, uh, it, the concern is that you will be re these people will never have a motive, incentive, or a necessity to fully assimilate because of the political network that allows them to live in these cloistered existences close to each other and maintain their culture separate and the religious practice is separate from the wider secular rule of law system of the United States. Yeah, so insofar as this is a problem, I see it as a problem with European-style welfare states rather than the United States. Uh, you know, assimilation in the United States is amazingly rapid. There, uh, you know, of course, there are always, uh, you know, always first-generation immigrants who prefer to live, uh, prefer to live among their own countrymen. But in terms of what their kids are like, uh, you know, like, like this doesn't seem to be to be a serious issue for the United States anyway. Uh, so and yeah, actually, so one of my co-bloggers at the, or like I see, it was one of my anyway, one of my students, one of the bloggers at the Open Borders website, just went over the data for what fraction of Mus of of, uh, of people who were born Muslim in the West actually wind up staying Muslim, and he gets a number that is about seventy five percent. So I mean, you basically have about twenty five percent apostasy per generation from the, from the religion. That seems like a pretty high rate to me. Uh, that you know that is way higher than say the Amish or something like that, where they have maybe maybe only a ten percent apostasy rate. Um, so you know, you know, if you know, if this is an argument for anything, I would say you know it is an argument against European style welfare states that make it possible for people to not to not go and work in the economy and interact with people from other groups. You know, so you may remember there's this passage from Voltaire where he talks about the London Stock Exchange and how it brings together people from all religions. And you know, even though they go home and they you know they each do their own uh, religious practices. But by day, they're all there making money together, doing trades together, and this is a way that you get people to interact fruitfully in the area where it's really important. Now, I would actually add that, as you know, you know very much in a cultural minority myself, when people talk about assimilation, I didn't think, wait, you're going to try to assimilate me? You know, I, I'm uh, homeschooling my, you know, so you know, one room over, I'm homeschooling my 13-year-old sons. I'm teaching them a lot of stuff that people in the society would find abhorrent. I have them do my labor economics class, for example. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you know, like so, when I, well, I mean, you know, to my mind, a key a key feature of free society is that people are free not to assimilate, to be different, to be weird, and that we respect that. And like, it is not a big deal if there's people that are not doing the same thing as everybody else, as long as they are not attacking other people, as long as they're peaceful, as long as they are productively interacting with other people. Then people should really, you know, you know, not only not legally persecute them, but I would go further and just say, you know, it is just good manners to show, show some respect and not make a big deal out of it. Well, how do you respond to some of the people who say that there are aspects of, uh, or at least certain uh, interpretations of the aspects of uh, Muslim uh, rel uh, religious practice uh, that that seem to be anathema to our secularized notion of rule of law? Yeah, so I would say you know, the same goes for the other major religions too. So if you re read the Old Testament, uh, Book of Deuteronomy 13, you know, so you know, you know, so kill, kill it, kill every man of the of the group that we conquered, kill it, you know, kill it, kill every woman that's lied with a man, and take the other ones and forcibly convert them to our religion. These ideas are all around. The wonderful thing about the modern world is great hypocrisy, so that people can officially say we believe in these books, but they don't actually live up to them, and that's actually why things are the way they are. Is that you know, even though people on some level are committed to some terrible things that are you know, truly liberal, when they actually live in a modern society, they mostly just forget them. Uh, you know, there are, of course, always a few people who insist upon not forgetting them. Most of the time, they're just all talk, but sometimes they are horrible criminals. And again, I would say focus on the horrible criminals, punish, you know, punish them, but uh, to go and punish everyone who says, I too believe in this book, which uh, does contain some terrible things, but I'm not, I'm not really doing anything about it. So it's not very important to me. Uh, so you, you mean, like, when you mention, mention events in Germany, you know, when I say this, I mean, my, my reaction is it would be far better to, to perform the most horrible punishments on the perpetrators than to go and punish the 99% of people who didn't do anything. I, uh, and rather, the inclination is to have you know, normal punishments for the perpetrators, but then to persecute everyone in the group, even those who statistically are incredibly unlikely to do it, such as, say, female refugees. 
You know, again, if someone were to respond to this and say, we're going to let in the same number of refugees, but only women, uh, to my mind, that would be a much more reasonable response than saying we're not going to take refugees because members of this group, like you know, a, you know, a few dozen of them were guilty of sexual assault on New Year's Eve. Well, yeah, on the, on the assimilation argument, I mean, I, I, I see people come into the United States and it doesn't matter to me one bit whether they assimilate or not. Uh, right now, I read an article where there's a million, more than a million Americans living in Mexico. They've retired. They're going to live the rest of their lives there. They don't, they're not learning Spanish. They're eating hamburgers. Uh, they, they talk to each other. They, they don't uh, associate with the locals. Uh, they still root for American sports teams. They retain their American citizenship. In other words, they're not assimilating. Right, right. I, say, I say, who cares? I mean, that, that's what freedom's all about. If people come here and they hang out with each other, a bunch of Muslims, as long as you're not, you know, initiating forth like human sacrifices or something and you're worshiping in your own way, who cares? Uh, and as you pointed out, uh, Brian, immigrants have always done that in the first generation. The, the Italians come and they go into little Italy and they hang out only amongst themselves yep. and a lot of them don't learn English. But then the children learn both right. languages. By the time the third one generation comes along, they're totally Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and you know, what's interesting is that while recently people are talking a lot more about Muslim immigration, again, the main kind of immigration the United States gets is from Latin America. Uh, is from Latin America, and there, of course, you know, they are as Christian as anyone in this country, probably more so. So, in terms of being part of Western civilization, as normally understood. You know, they're they're right in the center, and yet I have not generally. I, I very rarely meet someone who has the view that Muslim immigration is bad, but Latin American immigration is fine. You know, I know one guy, but <laughs> but normally there is a state jail. Like you know, for each group, there's a series of complaints, which again could just be it happens to be by coincidence, but to, to me it speaks more of a you know, xenophobia, dislike of foreigners, and then for each foreigner, it's more the question of right, what's wrong with them. Okay, we know there's something wrong with them. Let's come up with a list of their problems. Let's come up with a list with another group's problems. I have this blog post called Misanthropy by, by Numbers, where I just say, look, if you just want to go and complain about a group, here's a set of steps that will ensure that we'll give you a bunch of complaints every time. <laughs> <laughs> right? And a lot of it is, you know, just look for the you know, so for, you know, just look look for anything that you can object to, and then don't quantify it, because quantifying it might might reveal that actually your complaint is not really a big deal. Instead, make lists. It's always easier to just make a list of a bunch of qualitative complaints and that can go on forever and you don't have to bore people by giving them numbers and by the end you've got a list of 30 bad things about this group and the work that someone would have to do to go and reply to you is so enormous and of course you know, at this point people have forgotten even what the complaints are. All they're thinking of is this is a group with 30 bad stickers on them and we don't want to deal with them so you know, think about it, like 30 bad things about nerds, 30 bad things about redheads. And it's not hard to come up with a list of complaints about people. Normally, of course, people don't uh, regard this as rude to do it for people who are citizens of their own country, but for foreigners, people are much more willing to play this game, and it is not taken as a pr as a problem in the person making the list, but rather, uh, well, let's listen very respectively to this person complain a lot about what everything wrong about Eastern Europeans or everything wrong with Muslims, everything wrong with Asians, uh, so on. Well, I th I think along those lines. Uh, many people who make complaints about uh, new immigrants from Latin America or other parts of the world don't realize that th th this, this is a, 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 a syndrome that has gone on almost throughout American history. Uh, the, the, the 1840s and 50s, the Irish come over, and a lot of Americans oppose that. Oh, you know, they're all drunks and they're Pope worshippers. How can they ever be real Americans? Then the Germans show up in the 1860s and 1870s. Many of them, many of them, draft dodgers to avoid much <laughs> wars. And all they want to do is cluster together in their communities. They don't want to learn English. They keep speaking German, and they they want to drink beer out of those big steins, listening to um pa pa music in the park on Sunday. How Sunday. will they ever be real Americans? And then you get the next wave of Eastern Europeans, including Russian Jews, around the 1890s and the beginning of the 20th century. And well, well, how could they ever be real Americans? You know, they're not. They, they don't believe in Jesus. And didn't they kill Jesus? I mean, so, so I mean, and 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 they and they capture little Christian children to make matzah out of. Now, but but these are the ideas that have been present. But the fact is, is that these waves. Uh, as long as our society was sufficiently open, I mean that both socially and economically. Uh, have always had this process. As you pointed out, the first generation finds it sometimes difficult to acclimate. The children 
more rapidly do. And by the grandchildren, the grandparents are an embarrassment. Well, let's not go that far. <laughs> they're here, <laughs> they're here well. That's the, if that, that's what the grandkids think. Uh, wow, the ingratitude. Well, I, 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 I mean, <laughs> These grandparents the, went, went and, and, and made a bold decision to, uh, to go and uh, do a new world and start over. Yes, yeah, so I, will, I will say, so my, my, my wife is an immigrant from Rania, and... You know, like you know, her, you know, her parents. You know, like you know, like you know, they're heroes to me. Like you know, like you know, they, like you know, they, they're different in a lot of in a lot of ways. But you know, like the courage they showed to go. You know, like you know, my father-in-law, he was 43 years old, didn't speak English. He had a good job in in communist Romania. He comes here and he has to be a janitor. And why did he do this? He did this so that his daughter could have a better life. So yeah, I'm not jumping on you, Richard. But you know, like shame on those grandchildren for not appreciating what their grandparents did. It's what they did was hard, and they're yeah, and they're, they're they're courageous people. And like the way listen, they, listen, they, listen I'm, respect. I'm, I'm, Show some respect, I'm, I'm, man. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here because my grandparents on both sides of the of my family came from Europe in the de in the decade before the First World War. I wouldn't yeah. be here uh, w talking to you if they hadn't done that. And, uh, I mean, so, I'm just kidding, Richard. But but, but, but the point is, but I meant it in the sense that the grandkids, f f f you know, are a little embarrassed because the grandparents talk funny. They don't talk, oh, yeah. sound like real Americans. That's the only sense I mean in that. But 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 this wave uh, is is the same. The the other thing the data shows is that you know groups stay the same. By the second and third generation, the degree of intermarriage between different national and ethnic groups is often immense. So in fact, that, that melting pot, even with the interventionists and the regulatory and the welfare state, has continued to be amazingly successful. Sure, sure. Yeah, there is really one big difference in Latin American immigration earlier waves, which is that earlier waves usually were only one generation long, which meant that after a couple generations, everyone from that group spoke fluent English because the first generation stopped coming. Right. Uh, so, like, you know, the German immigration, there's a wave of German immigration and then it stops. Right. More or less, which means that uh, two generations later, everyone of German ancestry in the U.S. speaks fluent English, and then people can say, see, Germans learn English. Whereas with Latin Americans, we, we have had now three generations of Latin Americans coming. So at any point in time, there's a first generation that does not speak fluent English, which then makes it easy to say, see, Latin Americans don't learn English. The real story is that in each case, second, uh, first generation uh, you know, people, first generation immigrants did not acquire fluent, uh, fluent English. Second generation English did. But the Latin American immigration has continued for a longer period, creating the illusion that they don't learn English when they do. Right. Well, and I would argue, okay, so what if they no. don't learn English? What's the yes. big deal? That I, I grew up in Laredo on the border, and when we did um, jury panels, I was a lawyer, um, it was at least 25% of the jury panel could not speak or write English. And they, they were American citizens. And the judge is very courteous with them, and he would give them a little little test, and he would uh, verify if they couldn't speak or write English, and that was it. Uh, they would be excused, and it's like no big deal. Uh, let yeah, them no big deal. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a pain in the neck, but yeah. So I would say, you know, like ultimately, it is not a huge deal. You know, if I were picturing a like you know 20 years that uh, only five percent of people here would speak English. I would at least be saying, "Oh, that sounds like a pain a, a pain for me." I would not I, I would not lift a political finger to do anything about it. But still, you know, like you know, it's it's not you know this is one of the less crazy worries in the you know, in abstract terms. But you know, so again, I think this is one that's just better met with facts and just saying, "Look, it's just not a realistic worry to think that you know, that your language is not going to become the predominant language." And actually, really, the best way to make sure that English remains the predominant language is just to let in a lot of immigrants from a lot of different places. Because as long as there's a lot of immigrants speaking a lot of different languages, English remains the focal mm -hmm. language for everyone to learn. Whereas if it's all, whereas it really is just a ton of Spanish-speaking immigrants, then maybe, just maybe, they're going to wind up getting uh, getting their own separate culture. You know, with, well, but you know, like even that is is a stretch. But you know, there are so like you know, like you know, countries like Belgium where you have you know two different national languages, it's kind of a pain in the neck for the people there. But again, like you know, that wouldn't happen if you had a lot of people. If you had you know, ten other other linguistic groups around, because then, like, all right, well, which is the main language spoken here? Let's, let's all learn that one, just so that we can communicate with each other, with each other, and not just with that group. So again, you know, like the you know, the the expression lingua franca, right? Which you know, which uh, is you know the French language. Again, the, you know, when there when there's a bunch of different groups, none of which have a kind of language in common, then they gravitate towards whatever is at least the most common one. So that is, uh, you know, is, is a key thing to keep in mind is, you know, like, and I would say like, you know, a lot of the complaints about immigration really do come down to either you could keep out the people from the one large group that's coming or you let in a bunch of other groups too in order to balance them so that you don't have to worry about them becoming the, the dominant group. 
So yeah, like if we were to let in only immigrants from Muslim countries, then I could start to see the worries being more reasonable. But as long as they're balanced out by immigrants from many other areas of the world, then look, they're going to be stuck down at 10, 15 percent of the population uh, where they're harmless. Yeah, if, if I can sort of switch back to where we had started in some of your comments, again, for, for the sake of uh, libertarian viewers who are confronted with arguments, perhaps don't have the kind of economics background that, that we do, um, th th there is often the argument that a, a large wave of immigrants, regardless of who they are and where they're from, uh, uh, puts us awash in a significant increase of, uh, of labor supply. Uh -huh. And that particularly at the uh, perhaps the lower end of the wage scales in terms of skills and literacy and everything, uh, that will harm uh, a, a significant segment of the indigenous American labor population. I wonder if you could address that. Yeah. Yeah, so unfortunately that's an argument where you really need to, to not only know some basic econ but some intermediate econ in order to really deal with it because you know the argument itself is basic econ. It just says big increase in the supply of labor is, gonna, is going to lead to lower wages for the people already there. So if all you know is, is, uh, is a very simple econ, the argument is on, is on very solid ground and the question is Hmm. Well, is there you know, like like is there anything and is there anything else going on that we really need to think about? And that's where, if I you know I, I would say yeah, actually there's a lot more going on. Uh, you know, in, so in particular, I just remember that there are many different kinds of labor. So and uh, and and the uh, and the competitors for one group are the or, you know, are are the suppliers for the other group. So if there is a big increase in the supply of say foreign-born professors, this is bad for me. Uh, however, it is good for all the people that are consuming professor services. Uh, and then the question comes down to, so if some Americans are gaining, others are losing, how do we know what the overall effect is? And again, that's where I say you have to come back to this argument I started with, which is focus on production. All we, so if you want to understand what is the general effect of something going to be, you need to say what is going to happen to the total production that is going, the, the total production is happening, and that's where realizing that the whole point of immigration is to move people from places where their labor produces little to uh, places where labor produce, produces much is key. So that's where you realize, right? So we're going to so the same number of people after immigration will produce a larger total amount of stuff, which means the living standards are going to be higher. And you know, I, I like to say, you know, this isn't trickle-down economics. This is Niagara Falls economics. When you look at how much more productive a Haitian is in the United States than he is in Haiti, it's about a factor of 20. So it's not, it's not 20 percent. It's not 200 percent. So you, you know, basically, you are increasing production by 2,000 percent for a Haitian just by moving him a few hundred miles, right? And when you, and when you keep that in mind. And, re and realize so the, the key to any economy is uh, you know is production compared to the number of consumers. That's where you really really do see aha that's uh, the, you know, that is actually the the big gain. Uh, you know like you know class I would also talk about other effects of immigration that tend to get ignored of uh, you know for natives, especially for real estate markets. So you know there's been some you know so there's been some good research on what are the effects of immigration on real estate prices. Uh, and the punchline is uh, real estate prices are increased by immigration. More, you know, more population means, means higher demand. And then just from the American point of view, uh, remember, who owns almost all the real estate in the United States? What is their nationality? The nationality is American. So I mean, ultimately, in my view on like, you know, you know, who loses from immigration, say you know, it is most people who have skills that are very similar to the immigrants who don't own real estate. So, and that is some people, right? And I think it would be dishonest to say that absolutely 100% of people of, of Americans would gain from it. Uh, but again, I would also say that's not a reasonable standard for change because it's hard to name any great change that's happened that was that was good for everyone. So Uber is bad for taxi drivers, and driverless cars are going to be bad. Are going to be bad for Uber. Right? So you know, the reasonable point of view is always to go and keep your eye on production. What is this doing to living standards, rather than uh, in general, rather than can we find someone for whom this was not a good change? Because you know, by that standard, right. every change is bad. The the parallel of of the of, of the critics' argument would be they would be they would have to be against uh, a shift in American uh, behavioral patterns where everyone decided to have seven or eight children instead of uh, one or two. Of course, of course. Because because they would be you'd have all these people that after a certain age were flooding the labor markets, uh, yeah. and and the same effect would be from indigenous population growth as from the arrival of immigrants from other countries. The logic could be the same. 
Uh, the, the other aspect that we can just sort of complement what you're saying, which I tell my students, is that yes, the immigrant, some immigrants may come in and increase the supply of labor in a particular sector or industry. But one element of that may be that it lowers labor costs from the manufacturer's point of view, which means he can now sell his product for less and at least break even or make a profit. Well, if the product is sold for less, that's going to leave more money in the consumer's hand to spend in other directions, and that's going to raise the demand for those other goods and labor to be able to supply it. Depending on demand elasticity. Yes. <laughs> Complements and substitutes. Yeah. Yes. All right, yes. But it's really just come down to, in you know, my view, you know, a lot of the problem with defending the liberty, libertarian view on anything, but especially immigration, is that the good arguments are actually, com are actually somewhat complicated. Right. Uh, and so, like you know, the amount of intellectual effort that that is expect that you that people need to exert in order to understand what's wrong with a lot of the main arguments is significant, and you know it's unfortunate actually. But but uh, see, so, you know, like one of the th one of the main things that I've been reading about in, in the you know, past couple of years is and so, uh, psychologists talk about something called social desirability bias, just the fact that people tend to evaluate claims just based upon whether they sound good. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, like how important is apple pie for America? Well. You want to really go and be against apple pie? No, no, no. Apple pie is very central to America. Right? You know, that's just one, one, one silly example, but you know, plenty of others. You know, like so, uh, like, who would want to go and you know and give give it and uh, and give it give a uh, an energetic defense of the wonder of drinking alcohol? Right? You know, a few will, but it just doesn't sound very good. You now, instead, the you know the kind, responsible person wants to go and talk about the dangers of it, and very few people want to go and do an ode to how happy alcohol makes me. And so, in political debates. Arguments that really are sound but that don't sound very good tend to not get much attention. And uh, you know, and again, especially if in order to understand what's wrong with the view that sounds good, you need to really think about it. Whereas to go with what sounds good, you just need to emote. You know, it's a tough situation we're in. Well, Brian, what do you say, though, when people say, look, if you open the borders, everybody in the world would come here? I mean, you would just have so many people, they would far outnumber the 300 and some odd million Americans. Uh, right. So there we've got you know, a number of examples that we can look to. Again, the main thing just to remember is that right now within the United States, there are a number of areas that are considered extremely desirable to live in, such as Manhattan, Beverly Hills, so on, and yet most people aren't moving to them. The question is, so why don't they move to them? Uh, you may remember a uh, viral guy on YouTube, the, uh, the, the rent is too damn high guy. Uh, so you know, the reason why Americans don't go and immediately move to these more desirable areas is that the rent is too high. Right, so areas that are nice are more expensive are more expensive to live in, and also in terms of the uh, the real standard of living you can have there, it's considerably lower. So, uh, you know, like so, be basically people give up a lot of, a lot in conventionally measured living standards in order to live in the nice parts of the United States, and this is a day where market prices actually give people the incentives that they need in order to consider: Do I well, yes, I'd like to be there, but how much do I really want to be there? Furthermore, uh, this is the good. This is the really nice part. These high prices give uh, give real estate developers and businesses an incentive to plan over the long term to accommodate the larger number of people that they know would like to be there if only the terms were, were a bit more favorable. So you know, you know the reasonable thing to think that would happen uh, if the borders were, were open right away is you know, there would be a large number of people who would come, who come very quickly and there the main bottleneck is just uh, the av availability of transportation. Uh, but the, but you know, like after this initial wave of people, especially people who already have family in the country who can go and help them adjust, after this initial wave, uh, in the short run, they're going to have a large increase in real estate prices and, again, in the short run, a fall in wages, especially in the areas where you have a lot of immigrants. Uh, what this means is that in the long run, of course, businesses are going to get ready to build an enormous amount of additional real estate and there are all kinds of businesses that will be available to go and take advantage of this. Uh, again, and again, this all sounds like a pipe dream. Again, it's very useful to go and take a look at what's happened in China and India over the last 20 or 30 years, where you start out with countries that are almost totally rural, and over the over this time, you've had literally hundreds of millions of people moving from rural villages into the cities. If this had happened overnight, it would have been a disaster. But it doesn't happen overnight. Partly, you know, in China, they actually have internal immigration restrictions. Uh, but a big part of it is that in the very short run, it's not appealing because you show up there and housing's really expensive and you can't find a job. But uh, there are entrepreneurs both building real estate and setting up new businesses that are constantly recruiting. So over the course of decades, then you go and build and, and bring hundreds of millions of people over. But even when conditions are a lot better for those who are there, 
Uh, you know, there, you know, there are natural market forces that lead the adjustment to be more moderate, although, again, I don't like to sugarcoat things. I think that you know, what people think about as happening over the course of a year or two years would happen over the course of 20 or 30 years. Although my view is that this would be fantastic. And again, like, like most of the estimates about how great immigration will be, will be specifically require the assumption that a lot of people will move. Right? So, you know, again, when I drive across this country, I see no reason why we couldn't have 10 times as many people here you know, like, like in the next 50 years. The country is basically a giant ghost town. So there's no reason why Americans could not build giant new cities, just as the Chinese and Indians have built giant new cities, turn towns that have right now are dying or have a few thousand people into new metropolises over the course of a few decades. Uh, it is totally doable. It is being done right now. And you know, again, like the only difference is whether it is through internal migration or external migration. But again, the economic logic is basically the same. Yeah, on a domestic level, I don't see people worrying about everybody moving to New York, and therefore right. we have to put immigration controls up. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I, mean, I mean, of course, we do have a few countries that almost everyone thinks are terrible for doing it, where they do have these internal migration restrictions. So you got China, of course, where they treat much of the population the same way that we would treat Mexicans, where they need papers in order to move around and to get a good job, and it's and they have to really struggle in order to get permission to go and and and, and get that stuff. Or, you know, in Russia, there's still internal restrictions on living in Moscow and St. Petersburg, which, again, to my mind, is barbarism, but the Russians, uh, Russians, especially those in Moscow and St. Petersburg, well, you know, it's keeping us from having to deal with those offensive peasants from Yakutsk or wherever. Uh, yeah. Well, it, is, it usually, in Russia, it isn't Yakutsk. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's the people from yeah. uh, Kazakhstan or the Caucasus Mountains. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they refer to those people in very impolite ways. Yes. Uh, uh, well, I mean, what, what, after the fame toleration of the Russian people? I'm, I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> well, it's interesting you mentioned about papers because, um, you know, I grew up on the border and I got accustomed to these checkpoints. But uh, these are the, the, the enforcement measures that come with immigration controls is something that I think libertarians forget especially the returns to support immigration controls. It's not just the controls or the law that they're supporting, they're also supporting the enforcement. Because if you don't enforce the law, people are going to violate it. Just, if you don't have any guards at the border, people are going to just keep crossing. So inevitably you, get, you end up with this huge enforcement mechanism, which includes checkpoints on the U.S. highways that are running east and west. Sure. And then they've got one north of Laredo, that um, about 40 miles north, it, I mean, you, it's surreal. You come over a hill and you think you're entering a, a new country. Mm -hmm. And it's it's to demand people's papers. If you're white, uh, you have a nice car, they wave you through. But if you're dark skinned, you look real poor, you got an old model car, you're going to have to have a passport with you. And yeah. they open your trunk if you have drugs there. And this is for people who never cross over into Mexico, just sure, people sure. traveling domestically. Yeah. And so you, we're talking about a police state environment that comes with these controls. Yes, and what we're saying is, is worthwhile because there is one of the most ridiculous urban legends in America is that we have open borders already and that it's super easy to cross. And here I just have to be a total economist and say, look, here is the right measure of how severe the, 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 border, restraint, the, the border regulation and border enforcement is. Namely, let's take a look at how much you have to pay a smuggler to get you over the border. <laughs> Right, and compare that to the wages of the people in the country that are getting smuggled. So for Mexico, where like right now it usually costs about four thousand dollars, this is several years worth of income for a rural Mexican farm worker. So when someone says, "Oh, the border's already open already. It's so easy. Just you know, run, jump, swim. Anyone can do it," you know, they are out of their mind to think that people are willing to pay several years' wages for something that is effectively free. You know, rather, you know, and when someone like this says, "Well, how can it be that there's so many illegal immigrants here when the well, if the enforcement is really that strict?" And the answer is because the gains are so large. You know, if you didn't have this enforcement, there would be a vastly larger number of people that would come. So really, it is not uh, really the number of people that are here is not a good measure of the uh, you know, you know, is, you know is, is, is a good measure of the, like the total number that want to come rather than how strictly we enforce this. Uh, yeah, so my dad, who's probably the most angry opponent of immigration I know, just cannot shut up with these ridiculous claims about how easy it is to get in the U.S. I really uh, the, there's an episode of the show King of the Hill where the, uh, the you know the, the the Texas white characters get stuck in Mexico without their passports and have to sneak back in uh, to the United States illegally. And you know, I 
I well, you know, you know, I would not literally wish it on my dad for him to do this, but just to see how hard it would be for him to get into the uh, get into the U.S. illegal, I, well, I I think it would be a, a a nice pedagogical exercise to realize the enforcement in the United States is extremely harsh, and you know, like another way of thinking about this is compare the fraction that come now versus the fraction that would come if they could come for the price of a bus ticket, and I think that makes it pretty clear how draconian our enforcement really is right now. Well, I look at it as a lawyer. I mean, you just go down to South Texas and you walk into a federal court and their dockets are clogged with immigration cases, illegal entry cases. Yes. You go into the detention center and they're all filled up with illegal entry yeah. cases. And, and by the way, also something that I learned only a few months ago but would shock me is that in federal prisons over the last 10, 15 years, there has been an immense increase in the fraction of people who are there for immigration offenses. And particular, not and again, not just human smuggling, but actually crossing. Normally, it only happens to you if you do it if you're caught a second time. But I think it is up to maybe 20 percent of the inmates in uh, federal prison are actually there now for you know, simply for uh, for, you know, for Ill Ill illegal border crossing and doing it a second time. And legally, there's no reason they couldn't be put there put there for the first offense. But so far, the U.S. doesn't want to doesn't want to go through with that. And if you remember how much the federal prison population has increased over the last 40 years. Uh, you know, so now I think there are. Uh, so I uh, I would have to double check the numbers to be sure, but if I recall correctly, there are now more people in the U.S. federal prisons for immigration offenses than were there total for all crimes in 1970. Yeah, and I'd so be not a small number of people that are now you know, like like being held in very harsh federal prisons with real scary criminals just because they came over in search of you know, in search of search of a job on a farm here two times. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge industry, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention because I grew up on a farm on the Rio Grande. That yeah, no, no, because, I remember your stories. These are, these are great stories. So everyone listen up. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that because of immigration controls, border agents have the right, or the authority, not the right, the authority, to enter onto any ranch or farm along the border without a warrant and to search anywhere in that property for illegal aliens. And then later, the Supreme Court upheld their authority to do this on nearby ranches and farms mm -hmm. that doesn't even that don't even abut the border. Right, right. Uh, so it's another example of the growing infringements on on rights that come with immigration controls. But in any event, we're out of time, guys. All right. So we have to wrap it up. Brian, thanks so much. It's yep, great thank, to have your yes. insights. Thank, thanks so much. Thanks. Great, great. Thank you for great, joining great, us. Great talking to you. Uh, always, always a pleasure. Keep in touch. Yeah, Richard, enjoyed the show. See you next week. Thank you.